Thank you for joining Anne's Art Desk. These videos are brought to you by the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Art Center Foundation. This, this painting is called Woman in a Purple Coat, and you can just search it up online. It's, it's a really common painting. Uh, it's a very popular painting. Um, so you can just find it somewhere. But I thought it would be fun to look at because it, it uses so many of the sort of basic ideas of abstraction. There we go. So do you guys see some patterns here that um, make you think of abstraction in general as we've talked about it? So all these things appear in here, and one reason I picked this one is because it's so good at this stuff. So it uses all these elements. Um, the one I printed is pixelated. Sheila? Yeah, the color, obviously. Yeah, the color is pretty strong. Um, and also, something that Matisse, I think, really pioneered is he exaggerated details. And in this case, he means patterns. Pattern. He just went wild with the pattern. And he's essentially looking for patterns. One thing that's kind of neat is I think that um, like these stripes are scraped out with the brush, like the end of the brush. And these stripes are scraped out with the brush out of the wet paint. Um, interestingly, that's something you see uh, Rembrandt do sometimes. So it's not something he invented. It's something that people had used for a long time. Just kind of cool. So in this thing, you see all the, he also chooses like these really fascinating shapes, like kind of weird to draw on it. But um, look at this cool negative shape here. Like he, he makes these really beautiful negative shapes out of his paintings. And you can see um, how he's going to start cutting out pieces of paper pretty soon, uh, which is kind of neat. I like that. Um, so do you guys want to try and do a kind of a paint along copy and kind of analyze the picture a little bit? This is something that's fun to do in the museum as well. And it's kind of looking like we'll start getting to go back to museums soon, which I'm looking forward to. So something I may start with here is rather than starting with my number two pen, which you'll see very easily, um, I may start with a number two pencil, just so I can sketch and see if I make too many mistakes. Um, so whenever I'm drawing a human, I tend to start with a head and a backbone and then build the rest of it on here. And I've already made her a little bit too big. So to draw accurately, it's not a sense of, I'm going to draw this line correctly. It's a sense of, I'm going to compare this part of the line to this part of the line. How far apart are they? And what size do they have to be in order for me to put the entire subject on my page? And how does, how does this shape move? This sort of copying is actually, if you copy things out of magazines or just um, copy photographs or drawings. This sort of copying is actually not dishonorable in any way. It will teach you how to draw well um, because all this comparative work, this is actually a really complex shape to draw and it's really just comparative. Um, you're not drawing it with a sense that you're gonna get it exactly right, but the, the method of getting it right grows out of this sense of, I'm gonna compare these two shapes, I'm gonna compare these two shapes, this point to that point, and having all the references to each other correct. Um, and kind of having a big sense of what shape she's going to fit into. Like, where is her waist? 
and then her hip comes out like this. You can see her calf go down like this. You know, you can even like take her, this is called drawing through, where you go from this side of her robe to this side. See how the line continues, but there's a gap in the middle. You take a gap on up to her front and see that she's wearing a beautiful necklace. And then as your lines, so see how I use very kind of sketchy, runny lines everywhere? And then as my lines become more secure and I, I'm happier with them, I tend to darken them. And then she has all these sort of ruffles where her robe has bunched. So he's doing a lot of things we talked about last week where he's kind of simplifying and stretching and moving the form around. Got that really wrong. And have a sense of who she is on the paper. But something that's sort of interesting about painting is our drawing from a painting. Um, so you have to be careful to not ignore all the other wonderful things that. Matisse threw in there. Because all of these things, she looks really mean. <laughs> it's really upset. Let's see. She looks so serene in the painting, and yet I've messed it up so badly. I think I know why. I think I've stretched her head up too far. Her head is really kind of relaxed and set into her shoulders. Here. That's better. Now she looks a lot nicer. Okay. He painted this motif many times. So um, if you like this one, there are others uh, that he did that are really fun to look at. Um, and often using the exact same props, but in different conformations. So it's kind of fun to look at what he did. I like having a, a boundary in my paintings. So maybe my boundary isn't the exact one he chose, but I can still use it. Does that make any sense? Hi, Shauna. How are you? I'm fine. I apologize for being late. I was in the middle of an art presentation that went over. So. Oh, that sounds funny. Fun. What was it about? Well, actually, I was giving the presentation to friends. There's a wonderful um, New York Times um, um, new series. Um, this was on Durr, um, mm -hmm. where they use a Zoom to um, kind of intensify the close-up to, you know, have the viewer really looking. It's mm -hmm. kind of a play on um, this Durr self-portrait from 1500. Um, I'll, I'll send you the link. It's just absolutely fascinating. And I think I've seen it, but glazed over it in favor of reading about a fly on somebody's head. <laughs> ah, so I spent, I discussed it with an art friend last week. We spent three hours looking at it. And today we spent an hour and a half with a, another group of friends because it's just so compelling in that, um, you know, we always, our objective for art is to have people really look with great intensity and not Something just... that's neat about the internet and high high quality photo photography is we can really 
here at home look at a square inch of a Monet painting that's in the Louvre it's or in the Musée d'Orsay. It's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, I'll send you the link. You can share it with the group. Um, but I also, I think that self-portrait that he did is one of the best paintings ever oh, painted. Yeah. It's an yeah. amazing painting. Yeah, it's fascinating to talk about. And, um, you know, we're just, the, the image is, is just so beautifully, um, you know, um, depicted on the screen. It's, it's so yeah. bright and, and the I think details he's are also so... also just bragging in that painting. He's showing you what he can do. Yeah. Oh, and he, yeah, yeah. It's so. essentially an advertisement. Yes, yeah. Which I thought was... It's wonderful <laughs> anyway i was putting my um, my time to a good good art cause so <laughs> anyway the art classes are fun because it makes you appreciate art all the more in the sense yeah. that it's not an easy process you know, I've, I've had the experience so many times where i go to the legion of honor or i go to the de young and there's a guide there who's telling if they have a private guide service you can hire a guide to take you through a fancy exhibit or whatever but the guides are often talking about the artist's private life or the politics or history of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to hear about what the artist did. You know, yeah. were they using a hog bristle brush? Were they using real lapis lazuli? You know, <laughs> I want to hear the technique stuff. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, it's really hard to find that level of, um, you know, um, um, insight. But, yeah. um, you know, he did, uh, this is, I'll just say this and then I'll stop, but it was just so interesting. Um, so he, he did all of his um, sketches um, with using silver point. Yeah. Because the graphite um, had not been invented for um, a few decades after that. Wow. So um, interesting that everything you see that, you know, looks like he's sketched from, from pencil is, is actually silver point. So I went online and did, watched a demo of creating silver point. Oh, it's such a laborious process. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. You know, one of my favorite scenes in a movie is the girl with the pearl earring where Colin Firth tells Scarlett Johansson how to make paint. In yeah, I should read about that movie. You know, yeah, the grinding pigment, mixing it with linseed oil, adding gum arabic. It's like he had to make it all by hand. And that may be why he made like 43 paintings in his life. Yeah. <laughs> I know he was mixing paint. <laughs> um, yeah. It's and, and this and this uh, portrait's actually done on um, oil or it's done on panel with you know using oil and that those northern renaissance um, breakthroughs in, in the use of oil paint were just amazing. So yeah. Anyway, was, making, like, I'm, I'm on my art high, so I know I, I can keep you on your so forever. Back to drawing. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Yeah, that's really. I'm glad you're having a good time with it. Um, so I thought I'd just add a little bit more here, and then start actually thinking about it. And I thought something that would make a really nice piece of art that's kind of separate. We're not making a forgery of Matisse. We're learning from Matisse, right? Um, because to make a forgery of Matisse, we would need oil paints, the same pigments, the same brushes, the same subsurface. You have to find all that stuff. It's, it's quite the process. Um, I don't know if there's a, this is an apocryphal story or if it's real, but apparently uh, somebody found in a flea market in Europe somewhere a really ugly painting of a woman, and it was done at the right time that... Um, it could have been a Rembrandt, but it wasn't. So they sanded off the painting and they did a forgery because they needed the wood in order to make the forgery look legit. Then it turns out that that actually was a Rembrandt on a bad day. <laughs> You're like, oh, whoopsies. <laughs> Everybody has bad days. Um, so I thought what would be neat would be to take if you have a nice thick black pen um, and just study it, the beautiful lines he uses. He uses some really awesome lines um, and essentially make a line version of the beautiful painting. Um, so this is like right back to where we started, right? This is line abstraction. It's essentially what we're doing in this very small little format. I think that the original painting is probably four by six or 18 by 24 or 24 by 30 or something like that. It's probably a pretty big painting. Something I've noticed with 
my plein air painter friends is they all paint too small. Um, it's, it's, I always feel like plein air painting, I could talk about, I could critique plein air painting a lot and I won't, but um, it's gotten really tight and small and controlled and I don't really like that about it. Um, so this is a small version of, of him. So you'll notice that he actually did use outlines in his painting. So wherever you see an actual outline, just make a nice black dark line. You could use a crayon, you could use a black oil pastel, you could use a marker, uh, a dip inkwell pen, whatever you have. You could even use a graphite, uh, like a dark pencil, like a number six pencil or something. Um, so anything will work fine. Um, I would caution you against using something that's water soluble. Um, so let me just demonstrate this. Here's a water soluble pen. And if you want to put water media over it, you're going to get this effect where it melts. Um, whereas this is a non-water soluble pen. Oops. Um, and you won't get that effect once it's dry. Oh, it's not dry yet. Um, but if you use a non-water soluble pen, you'll get kind of a prettier painting in the end. I also think Sharpies are not truly, they, they also melt a little bit. Yeah, they're pretty good. Um, so you can test what you have. I think this sort of a, a writing pen is particularly bad. Yeah. So give it time to dry if you're really running a real test. Um, because I happen to know that the microns won't wiggle once they're dry. So that's what I'm going to use. And I'm using a really thick one because uh, I think it will help the painting. And I'm also looking, see how the line gets thicker and thinner? That's actually part of his style. And so I'm trying to use that. Something that's really important for drawing, and I'm just gonna do this over here for a minute, is when you're drawing, it's just like speed reading. You know how if you read really fast, you read in a big chunk? You know, I tend to read half a line or a line at a time. Um, and this is something you teach small children. Don't read it a letter at a time, read a word at a time. Don't read it a word at a time, read it two or three words at a time. So when you're drawing, like if you wanna draw this sleeve, Draw the sleeve in big chunks like that. Don't go like this. This, this doesn't give you a confident line. Not lots of corrections. It's far better to do this and then make a correction than it is to do this. I always prefer to see that you made a mistake and corrected it than that you were afraid to go for it. And you actually see this a lot in old paintings. You can see where uh, painters made mistakes. You see this instead of this, this instead of this. So it's fine to make mistakes, just go right back in there and, and you know, with confidence, redraw the line. Nobody will, nobody will bother you about it. Does that make sense? This is a very basic thing I tell most people that I'm helping to learn to draw. It's like, do it with confidence, Make your, you know, bite off big pieces of line. Um, and you'll find that your drawings immediately look much stronger. They look like you know what you're doing. And indeed, you do know what you're doing. So why not? So, um, Shauna, we did a little bit of drawing before you got here. You can freehand this if you want. I like all these ruffles back here. Remember we talked about leaving some air between lines? This would be a really great place to do that. And you can see that he did it a little bit too. 
Um, and again, you can pull this up on the internets, um, or it's also in the Google Classroom. If you want to see one more clearly, then you can see it on my desk. I'm also, I really love seeing books and magazine and pictures. So I'm of course going to add the book. And I also really like seeing a frame. I don't really care if things hang off the frame, but I like having one so I know kind of where my edges are. How's that? And then I just sort of keep going. There's this, her skirt ends here, right? Um, so these are places where he didn't put a black line, but I'm still going to put one. Um, there are these little loops or clasps on her dress. There are four of them. You see this big bead necklace a lot in his paintings. I don't know if this model just owned it and liked wearing it or if he had it in his studio. Something that's sort of, I think, kind of tender and lovely about this painting is you can see that the hands made him nervous. He was really shy about painting her hands. I think that's really sweet. And he just sort of, they're kind of floppy and not very defined. Um, and the face is really stylized, as if he just wanted to stylize her face. He didn't really want something super um, indicative of, of who she actually was. I kind of wonder if you asked him if he would say he was a good drafts person or if he would say he can't draw and that's why he paints funny. I don't know what he'd say to that. So it's like she's got her arm up on this thing. So here I've done it wrong, so I'm just making it right. Let's see, what have I missed? these giant weirdo flowery things in the background.
There we go. How are you guys doing? So I think what's remarkable about this little sort of proto forgery is that if we do drop some color in it, it will start to look quite real. debating on whether to put her stripy dress in or to do that with some other element. Let's see here. I'm just going to use watercolors. Um, what are you guys doing with this? Does this make sense? I can see you all working very hard on it. What? Is it frustrating or interesting? Is it interesting? It's interesting. It's fun. I'm just not very fast. <laughs> yeah. I'm just sort of accept that it may not come out very perfectly, or you can also do a subset of it. Um, the other thing I was going to do before I begin to paint on it, this eraser just plain old doesn't work. Um, is erase all my little pencil lines and kind of clean up the, the surface. And if you look at my drawing pretty carefully, it, um, it has a lot of sort of drawing errors in it. Like her head is much too small um, and she's positioned too low on the paper. And I got really lost in the flowers and I just sort of made them up because I wasn't drawing very carefully at that point. But again, it's, it's not meant to be a truly careful forgery. It's, I like this idea of proto forgery. It's, a, it's the idea of a forgery. and take a uh, clean brush and sweep stuff away. Not my hands, because my hands can make marks and things and add oil to the paper, other things. Maybe just a paper towel.
See, I still don't have enough of the pencil off. You can take the pencil off after painting as well. It's just a little bit harder. And some of the paint seals the pencil in. Shall I just give you guys a couple minutes? Yeah. All right, let's try this. tempted see how she divides the whole paper up into several pieces I'm kind of tempted to paint her purple coat last um, after everything else has dried because that means that all the other pieces I can paint them quickly because they won't touch each other whereas if I paint her purple purple coat and I make it wet I have to wait for it to dry before I can continue I have to get my heat gun out so I think I'm going to actually start um, you can also do this with the um, watercolor pencils, which would be a much more controlled way to do it. But I can't find mine right now. I think I took them out on a picnic and I did not put them back. So my bad. Um, I have an idea though. I have watercolor crayons. I'll use these instead because I think that they'll look very beautiful. So these are aqua color crayons, so they'll melt this just as well. And that means I can paint the whole thing and then melt the whole thing and it'll work beautifully. Um, so they're like your pencils, except they're, they just don't have the wooden stuff. Something that's kind of neat about color is that you can replace color if you stick within the value zone. So this is a dark green. It's not as yellow green as I would like it to be, but however, it's it does just fine. And I could modify it with a yellow green to make it more like the other green, but I really don't have to. It's fine. This color kind of works its way all the way down the painting including down here. To about here. Something that doing one of these little proto forgery does for you is it, it really shows you things you haven't looked at before. So like, I didn't even notice this stuff, this red, and then this other stripey stuff here which is actually just the outgrowth of this stuff. So I missed all of this. And that's just because I wasn't looking quite carefully enough. But I will. So I can probably modify that green a little bit with um, the yellow and make it more like the original painting. And when I melt it, it'll just um, melt together. And her skirt, it's kind of a blue-green. So I'm probably gonna do 
a mix of blue and green. I, because you see how he flattened his color, he didn't show a lot of light and dark gradation in his colors. That's very abstractionist. So I'm going to follow his example. Just keep the color field essentially like coloring in a coloring book. a stronger blue to make it right. Um, and then that bright yellow, which is lovely. I think we spent some time in a hot car because they're rib shaped. As you add color to this, you can also think about what um, what color decisions did he make? So that yellow and that purple, he actually decided to put those two color fields right next to each other. And he also decided to put the yellow flowers on the other side. They may not even have been yellow, or he may have gone to the market and bought yellow flowers because he wanted them in his painting. So do you have a sense of what the sort of color theme of this painting is? Like what is what are the main color statements he's using here? Shauna, you've showed your geekiness. You gotta now you gotta do it. <laughs> I can't hear you, you gotta unmute. <laughs> well, actually your crayons are covering it up. So okay. I can't see the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So I mean the complementary, the the yeah, green, the purple, the you know the red. Them. Yeah, and then the green is doing something for it. Yes, giving a contrast. Yeah, like Make providing it. a third leg. Kind of yeah. Thing. It's almost like it's um, what do you call that? An an offset primary. So instead of being mm -hmm. red, yellow, blue. It's purple, yeah. orange, green. It's like yeah. he kicked the he kicked the color wheel to the yeah. right. My, I have my color wheel right here. I never leave home without it. <laughs> oh, except I'm in too much dark myself this morning. I sat in the wrong spot. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Do you it's make that? Wow. <laughs> it's a it's a mouse pad. <laughs> I got oh, it. That's amazing. wonderful. Yeah. So, but I think um because I can't draw. And, but this exercise of, um, of trying to draw this and putting in all of the details around is just the perfect way to really understand and really truly look at Matisse. And that's so is it helping you or infuriating you? Well, it's no, it's helping me. Um, watch you draw. <laughs> What you draw. It's frustrating me trying to come up with an image that could even, you know, begin to look like in the piece. And it's also and if you look at um, if you just search woman with a purple robe, a yeah. lot of people have copied this painting. Oh, I have with more accurate drawing than others. And you might find yeah. it comforting or interesting to see the the really fabulous art that comes out of a copy of this painting, whether it was accurately drawn or not. It's really yeah, interesting. That's true. I have to give up trying to make it look like yeah. what I'm looking at. Um, I will say that Matisse is so magical, and, and especially with his just line work, um, those um, female bodies that he does with three or four lines um, to just create the whole essence of the beauty of the form. It just, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's amazing. Yeah, you can really see her underneath her clothes, even though she's wearing these real elaborate clothes. Kind of cool. Um, he did a lot of paintings like this, and something you might do as an exercise is render them in line. 
because they're fairly simple partitioned images. And he used line a lot and he flattened the form. So you won't be fighting with three dimensionality. You'll just be working on um, how do the lines interact. So it might be very helpful. Thank you. Because I think the drawing I did actually looks like a coloring book page. I was startled at how sort of appealing it was. I didn't expect that. <laughs> so let me see. Um, I was I was looking around for little bits of red because I saw that there were some. And I'm also just going to add dark to some dark bits. Uh, there's a little bit of kind of this sort of thing. Um, and then there's also her necklace has this sort of red emblem on it. And then we're really to the point where she just needs a skin tone of some kind. But her skin tone is more peachy pink than that. It's not quite right. Here's another thing I didn't notice when I was drawing that she has this sort of neckline. There we go. And one thing that's super weird is that her hair is green. She has really, really green hair. Maybe there's a little bit of red mixed in, but super green. Um, I need a different red. But if you don't have all the colors that are um, in the painting, it's perfectly fine to either mix colors or just to be like, that's red, I'm going to put in red, whatever red I have. And it will actually read quite well. You won't be super alienated by it. Where else am I missing? Oh, I completely miss all of this stuff too. I do know that the, um, the Palace of the Legion of Honor has um, uh, artists in residences, artists are residencies, and I've always wanted to do it and just go and either copy paintings or make art inspired by the paintings or something. I'm just going to leave her waistcoat super white, even though he modeled it a little bit, just because I think that the painting will look neat more, it'll look better. And I'm going to put a hot pink over this purple. But her slippers really are purple, so do that. Maybe I should have started with the hot pink. We'll see how it looks. I can always put Posca pen over the top if I want to cheat. Um, so now comes sort of the truth telling part. Let's see how it looks wet. Oh, cool. It's going to be really vibrant, which is neat.
And I'm going to wet things sort of that are separate from one another in order, just so that I don't end up with big bleeds, that it comes out quite clear what's what. And after I do this, I can add other things on top. I can add more pen marks. I can add a white pen or white paint, um, which I'll probably do to make the coat stripy. Um, I can modify the colors once they're dry with more pigment. I kind of like just making these a little bit wet because they're kind of fuzzy in the picture. Oh, you know, I completely forgot that there was sort of a skin tone here. I have to do that. Also forgot to put in all this stuff. It's like a huge band of green around this thing. This little table appears in all of his paintings. And on top of it, this is sort of the only place he's added sort of a dimensionality to the picture, where he's showing the shadow of some of the fruits and things. I just bought this little Kalinsky sable brush at the art store, um, kind of because the art store person was like, you should buy that brush. I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> and I find that I really love it. He was right. I should have bought that brush. So. Something that's really fun about this is it really does feel relaxing when you color it in because you've essentially created a coloring book page. And I think that's part of it being a Matisse in that he flattens all his colors and he finds patterns and shapes. So essentially when I drew it, I created a coloring book page and now I'm just filling in the coloring book page, which is a little bit like making a Lego kit from a kit instead of pre-making Legos. There's something kind of feeling quite restful about that. I completely forgot to color that thing in. Let's see what we can do about that. Kind of reddish brown. How are you guys doing? Do you want to show me what you've got? Hmm. And maybe I'm... Everybody's working. Oh, hi, Karen. Welcome. Nice to see you. Sorry, it's loud here. My kids are doing a class in the background, but it's good to see you too. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can see my daughter's office in the background today. <laughs> we all live here together. You know.
let's see. So this, this part of it, I'll come back in when it's dry with a little um, white paint or white pen and just go over it a little bit. So are you all using watercolor pencil or watercolors or some other medium to do this? Because you could also do it with markers um, or just crayons. I'm using um, pan watercolors. Oh, cool. Yeah. This will work really well. Make sure you saturate the colors so like you if you're using pan watercolors, make sure you keep adding water to the pans and then coming back and dropping more pigment in. Okay. Yeah, just so that you don't end up with something that's very pale. Because watercolors um, dry more pale than they are. And so you always have to be sort of working that back. Actually, I like the, these crayons because I love how vibrant they are. They're just singing off the page without lots of effort on my part, without me having to go back to the pans and keep on picking up new paint and putting it down, making it more and more vibrant. Uh, I kind of like that about them. Something you can also do is combine your watercolor pencils and your pans. So for instance, like this part of the painting, there's a little wash. But if I used my watercolor crayons, it would be too vibrant. But if I just take a little bit of blue and make a little wash, that's kind of just about right. Not too much pigment, just enough. So see that over here. And then also we see it kind of here too. I'm gonna knock that little table back a little bit. I like the combo. It looks more real already. Notice like you can get all the way into a painting and realize, oh wait, this whole area up here is supposed to be very dark. And I just didn't do it. I don't know why not. Um, so what I can do is, I actually think it would look pretty cool if I just carefully, without smudging the paint, went in here and did this. But you can also just do it with paint or with watercolor markers. Something that's interesting and frustrating about felt tip pens is they will not work when wet. Um, so they don't work well if you've already made some marks with water. Something that's kind of neat about copying a painting is if you do leave something out, you can see what that something does for the painting. Because I feel like the painting's leaving stronger as I re-strengthen this back corner.
And then there's something else that I just plain old missed, and that's that there's a little bit of sort of green foliage in this delight. If you can hear it, it's kind of some dabs of green. I think I'm going to just do it with a green something. I think with that, she's sort of almost done. Um, see a little bit of this. Um, see. So we started out class with this little bit of UFO paper. And I thought I'd just show you what happened because it did dry. Um, so if you weren't here at the beginning of class, this is this is a plastic paper that is very, it's, it, it's having a moment right now. It's kind of a new invention and it's having a little faddish moment. And I thought I'd just show it to everybody because you might enjoy playing with it. Um, the art stores have it um, and its name is um, and it it's kind of funny because it's really really nice for um, kind of water media effects but it also takes pen and ink really beautifully so you can kind of combine things on it and you can see that the watercolor we put on the beginning of the class is completely dried um, I think the other thing you can do with it is you can literally scrape stuff back off with an exacto knife, which is kind of interesting. But if you kind of have a penchant to play with fluid art, this is kind of a good way to do it without having big splashy bins of acrylic paint in your backyard. Because um, it'll do a lot of fluid art effects without the the gallons of paint flying around. Um, see if we can I'll have a little scraper. Uh, here we go. I don't think I have my knife here anywhere. Um, but you can make white lines in it with just an exacto blade as well. Scrape the back off again. I wonder if this would work. Yeah, really. Sound fun. Um, I'll post my friend's uh, website who does really interesting work with this stuff. Um, she's sort of an environmental art artist and she kind of coaxes plants and biological matter to make their own marks on paper, which is sort of an interesting idea. I kind of like that. So I thought I'd show it to you. Can go play with it if you wish. Do you guys have any questions about this process? Um, you can try it again with one of his other paintings. It's, I actually think it's really good if you're trying to strengthen your drawing skills. Um, and then at the end of it, uh, something you can do to sort of double check yourself. This is sort of the oldest trick in the book, but it's, I find it very useful. Um, it's just turn your drawing upside down and you'll instantly see um, what some of the, some of the errors you made were. Like for instance, her head is much too small and I just added extra to the top of the painting by accident. Um, her waist or her whole body is, is thicker than the original. And I, I don't know how that happened, I'm, but I'm fine with it. Um, see what else happened. 
I didn't see how the flowers are in two bunches. I just drew one bunch because I wasn't drawing very carefully. Um, so when you turn your drawing upside down next to its, its source material, you'll pretty quickly be able to double check yourself. Um, something that I could do for this thing is when I look at it, you can also look at it for color. For some reason, when it's upside down, you can see the color better. Um, is I realize that I really do want this to be sort of a yellow green and not a turquoisey blue green. Or I can add a little yellow on top. And it will mix in just fine. That's better. Jonna, what do you think? I'm thinking that it might be less intimidating to draw it at the beginning upside down. Um, yeah, I actually just, think it would be. Yeah, I'm just, just speaking as a total novice that cannot draw. And I periodically take art classes to remind myself as much as I love looking at art and spend all my time doing that um, to, you know, render lines accurately or properly is, yeah. is something. So um, I just, um, it's, but then I'll go back to what I've done in other art classes. I said, well, maybe that's not that bad. And I come back again. But um, it's just so hard. And I know part of it is with everything, the only way you can learn is just to do it and do it and do it. So um, I actually don't agree um, with that so much. There are lots of sort of drawing exercises that I've found very useful for people, where if you do them, you, you make a lot of progress really fast. Um, so, and I think I have a few video recordings you can watch on my YouTube channel. Oh, and I'll okay. link to them. Okay, I didn't know you had a YouTube station. Yeah. So, and maybe I'm using that as an excuse that it, the key is to do it over and over and over again. Maybe that's well, the key is to do it strategically, like to learn the skills you actually need. Um, yeah. And something that I've found in teaching drawing is if I break drawing down into little tiny chunks and people learn each small chunk, then all of a sudden they realize, oh, I can do this. Because mm -hmm. drawing is actually a very sort of meta skill. You have to, it's a little bit like learning to ride a bicycle. Um, you have to brake, steer, look ahead, look behind, follow the other people you're with, think about your route. You know, you're doing a lot of things all at once. And drawing is a lot like that. So if you break those things down into little chunks, you can learn to draw much more quickly than if you just draw and aren't very happy with the result and draw some more and are not very happy with the result. <laughs> Repeat. Um, so also I'll put some things in the, in the stream that you might find useful, including I have a few uh, line drawings that are just particularly good for doing upside down drawing because they're really simple and straightforward. Um, and they kind of break the visual field enough that you start drawing the lines instead of drawing a figure or drawing a person or drawing features, mm -hmm. which is really, you have to, to draw accurately. You have to stop looking for things and start looking at shapes and relationships, um, lights and darks, lines. You have to start literally entering into that abstract perception instead of yeah. thinking, I'm gonna draw a nose, now I'm gonna draw hands. Oh, I don't like hands. I kind of think, cool. Yeah, I do like like what we did. I think it's pretty cool. I've done this in with a painting medium before, and there's actually a YouTube video of me doing a very similar painting from Matisse, but with acrylic. So it actually ends up looking a lot like the painting. It's much more like a forgery. Um, so you can have a look at that too if you want. Um, let me see. Oh, I wrote this upside down. <laughs> I usually make notes about what I'm going to post to the, to the class. All right. Anybody have comments or input or feedback? Is this a really frustrating exercise? Tell me and I'll never do it to other students again. <laughs> I thought it was really useful. You definitely yeah. see things in more detail in different ways doing it this way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I thought it was great. And it was the only frustration was just my own inabilities. It wasn't the exercise in any way. The exercise is fascinating. Yeah, the other thing you can always do if you're making a copy is just, um, let me do it in a pen you can see, just decide what you're going to copy. You know, bite off what you can chew. It doesn't matter. You know, or even like, maybe you don't like doing that. Maybe it's, maybe you're interested in this. You know, it's great. You don't have to do the whole thing. Um, and indeed, a standard art exercise in art school is for somebody to, the teachers often do this to people, are like, take something that's essentially an abstract section of a very small master, like a small abstract section of a masterwork and make it two feet by three feet and make it precisely the same. You know, so not something that's a foot, so you, you wouldn't be allowed to choose this, right? You have to choose something like that. Where you can't tell what it is, but you have to, duplicate the brushwork and the colors and all that. It's kind of an interesting exercise. Okay. Those are fun ideas. Um, so I'll, I'll, make a, I'll make a homework idea for you based on this kind of idea because I wrote the homework at the beginning of class and then class sort of went in a different direction, kind of based on my feeling of what you guys would like to do. So I'll write a homework up for you guys for this evening. And you're always welcome to submit whatever you want. You don't have to do the homework. Um, you can do whatever artwork you feel like. All right, finishing up this painting with a little Taylor Rowney Pro White. And this nice pointy brush. And what I'm doing is just looking at the stripes in her dress and adding them on top of the paint that's already there. I think that Matisse originally did this either scraping out the paint or he also did a similar process. But the stripes actually say a lot about what way the folds of the dress are going. So I wanted to add them in. And you have to look at them kind of carefully and draw each one patiently. I'm sure he took about 60 seconds to do the original. Um, but copying is differently different from creating. This one actually reaches all the way. Because I drew her a little bit wrong, not all the stripes fit. And that's okay. I just sort of accept that they're not all going to fit. start on this side. Maybe like right here is a good one to begin with. Something you have to be careful with when you're working in any media on a flat surface is not to drag your hand over your painting. Um, the water media that's under these white stripes is dry, but I have to be careful not to hit the white stripes as I'm working around the painting. Um, you can think about uh, different ways you work, like you can start at the top so that you don't work bottom to top, or you can just not rest your hand on the painting. And for the sleeves, I'm not being as careful about which 
ones go where, but I am noticing as the sleeve lengthens, the stripes become less straight across each sleeve and they start to describe the curve of the sleeve. That's pretty important. So now since I painted that, I have to not rest my hand on it. Notice how the stripes respond to the rumples in the cloth. Seems to me like some of these stripes may need to be gone over because some of them look a little too pale to me already. So I may have to come back with another layer. This is neat because these stripes go up the other way. So you can see that even though this painting is very abstract, it's also very realist. Like, that actually happened all those years ago. The coat really folded this way and that. instead of dark, as they are in the original. So I'm going to add a little bit. Okay. Favorite sound. <laughs> 